good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. It's a joy to be worshiping with you this morning as we celebrate in this Advent season, light of the world, stepping down into darkness. Welcome. Welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. Hope is a growing community, finding hope in Jesus and extending that hope to others. I'm Pastor Todd here at Hope Presbyterian and uh, again... It's a thrill to be with you. Looking forward to worship. A few items just to remind you of of what we're, we're of this place, of where we are. Um, one, if you, you figured this out, but if you need a chair, we're just grabbing our own chairs in light of wanting distancing. They're along the walls or in the back. Um, and then worship guides are should be on the table, printed worship guides. You want to grab those. In an age of individualism, in an age of consumerism that says, uh, entertain me. We believe that we are called to be a body, <laughs> that we are called to be contributors and people who participate. And so as we shape ourselves to be God's people like that, we like to have a worship guide with us. Grab one. Uh, another detail that I want to mention every time, there are bathrooms actually underneath here. There is one up here, but if you want to be less conspicuous, you can go down underneath kind of this side of the room. There's a little hallway. You go through a door. You'll come down. You'll find bathrooms down there. So... You can head to the back, down the stairs, our bathrooms down that way. I think those are all the details that we need for those of you that are guests with us. Uh, anything else I forgot? I think we got it all. We're here to worship. As I said already, the light of the world has come. People living in darkness have seen a great light. So God's people, oh well, God's people, all people, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, let's stand and give God glory this day. Join me in the call to worship that you find on the top of page two. Our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. The Mighty One has done great things for us. Holy is God's name. Let us worship God, for God is our maker and our redeemer. And from generation to generation, God gives mercy. Let us pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we do come rejoicing in you, our spirits, as we just echo the Magnificat. Our spirits rejoice in you. We gather to worship you, our maker and redeemer, for you have come into our world to rescue all that was lost, all that was dark, all that was confusing. So Father, we give you glory and praise for you have initiated our rescue. Son, you came as the babe in Bethlehem. We adore you in spirit. What is this stirring you have done in us that we want to sing and we want to glorify you? We can't fully explain it, but you've done it. So stir up our hearts in praise, we ask this day. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remain standing as we sing.
seated and we'll give our attention to the Old Testament reading and the lighting of the Advent wreath. I had a seminary professor who said, I wrote it down because I wanted to get it right. He said, when people say bad things about you, don't get upset. Just think of what they might have said if they knew the truth. <laughs> get it? <laughs> Confession in the church is an act, not just because we want to grovel, we want to feel bad. It is something the church has historically done done because we don't take ourselves too seriously. We take God and his grace seriously. We know that if you knew the truth about us, there's a lot of things this very week we need to be honest about and ask forgiveness about. It is the practice of reminding ourselves that we have no reason to be upset or defensive when someone says bad things about us. Easier, easier said than done, isn't it? And yet that's what this practice of confession is to do in our lives, weekly, daily, if it is our practice. Join me as we form ourselves through these words of confession. O oh, promised Christ, we confess the turbulence, violence, and warfare of our external world and our internal world. Our peace depends on your coming. We confess that we are a sinful people, displayed in what we've done wrong and in the good we have left undone. Our pardon depends on your coming. We confess that we are full of good intentions, but weak at keeping promises. Only our hope of doing your will is that you should come and help us. Lord Christ, word made flesh, our world waits for your peace, your pardon, and your grace, hear our silent prayers of confession. say bad things about us, we don't have to get upset or defensive, is because there is a louder voice that is more clear, speaking grace, acceptance, and pardon to you. And that is our next movement in worship. So brothers and sisters, what can wash away our sins? Nothing, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We, we have died, died together. together. We, we will rise together. together. We will live together. We extend this response here in Advent using the longer version. Do you renounce the sinful desires that would separate you from God and from his people? We do. 
Do you renounce the evil desires of this world that corrupt and destroy his good creation? Do. do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Do. Then stand in the good news of what God has done. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we receive adoption as sons. It is good news. And what is the good news of this Advent season? Christ, who came among us in great humility, saves us from our sin and offers us new life. And he also offers us peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. Greet one another, saying, the peace of the Lord be with you, and replying, and also with you. Thank you. Peace, peace of the Lord be with you. Peace be with you at home. Peace, peace be with you. with you. Hi, George. continue in worship with the giving of God's tithes and our offerings. We continue our practice during the pandemic of not passing a plate, though maybe we should get back to that. But there is a tin back there if you'd like to give. I remind you, checks are always made out to Trinity Presbyterian Church as we are not yet independent, but we want to be, and uh, we're moving that way. Um, uh, but you can also give online, but you look down at your worship guide, and as most of you know, our practice is to offer ourselves in prayer. 
And so we have an Advent prayer here for our offering. So join me as we ask God to now form us into being gracious people. Gracious God, this Advent season, season we watch in love and, and we, we give, give in love. love. We give you our offerings and our very selves. Use, Use them, them to bring, bring our love to the world. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you of things going on in the life of our family. Um, for one, most parents, I think, with children know this, but Emma was not feeling well this morning, so out of caution, she's getting she's our nursery worker, uh, so she's not here. But during the sermon, if uh, you you're, there are um, children's bulletins on the table back in that room. If your child would like to go back and do one, they can go back and do that. We'll leave the door open and they can just wander around. Well, back there and forth, you know what I mean. Uh, the Cantrell Small Group meets today. They're over here in the alcove. Um, and so uh, you got an email on that. I think if you have not yet attended and you'd like to talk to them, uh, they're over there. Other than that, there's two things, uh, details, I wanna bring clarity to. Um, and that is, we have a number of things we've been offering. I've got a lot of props up here, so let me let me get these um, in this season. One is uh, is the daily prayer project. Um, some of you know about this. We have two items for formation we're offering right now. One is the daily prayer project. I want to just read what they say uh, of what what their goal is. The daily prayer project. Before I read it, uh, is what we do as a church year-round together to be formed and learn morning and evening prayer and to join with the broader church, not just ours, as this is put out by one of our churches up in D.C. And they use prayers from around the world. So here's what they write on their website. The Daily Prayer Project is a movement that exists to animate the life of prayer through the manifold beauty of the church. We connect and unify Christians by resourcing them with daily prayers, practices, music from the global historical church, and visual art of spiritual and artistic value. All of these rich resources are built into a simple, functional, and beautiful product, our living prayer periodical. Now, they print up a really nice one that we didn't buy into, so we can get it via email, or by this kind of thin version that I've given just the bare bones to, but I sent out the PDF to those who are practicing this with us. I'm spending this time to say, if you would like to join our church as we together journey in doing the Daily Prayer Project, we invite you to, especially as we just started a new year last week, Christian year in Advent. So let me know, speak to me about that. That's the Daily Prayer Project. The other one is we've talked a lot about an Advent resource. Uh, that we have a family devotional that Laura made for us as our director of formation and is something for us to use regularly in our households around enlightening the Advent wreath and preparing ourselves for Christmas as a household. So that also is available. That is something we're only doing in Advent. Okay? So just because people have been like, well, we have this resource and that resource, that's what we're doing. Okay? Uh, I said I had another thing. These are a lot of words, aren't they? But, uh, is, um, is you are going to hear more. I just want to say this. You are going to hear more. You're seeing in our Friday email about generosity. The reason why you have not gotten any details on that yet is because we hope to help some families in need. That is our plan. But they're going to kind of be 911 calls is what we're thinking as we talk to the counselor at Crozet Elementary School. If they don't come in, we will use those resources in the future. But that's and we'll talk about that and giving a mercy offering at our Christmas Eve service. Those details are to come. I just kind of want to put them in a, what's it called, a parking space to talk about here in a meeting. Now, those are things going on. But as you see in your worship guide, we also have a very exciting uh, thing today, an encouraging thing, and that is we have three households coming up to take their membership vows. They'll be joining with us as part of the church. Um, it, it's an exciting time for us as a church, because if you remember, what was that, four weeks ago or so? Jim, in our meeting, we've been talking about that to move us towards independence, we need to grow our membership. And so this represents answered prayer. That's pretty cool. Folks are saying, we want to join with you. So if you're a member of Hope, you should be pretty encouraged. If you're a regular attender of Hope, you should be pretty encouraged. Um, but we at Hope 
do join with the historic church whenever we have someone join our church. We say one of the creeds. The church has historically done that. To represent the fact that they aren't just joining us. There's this long belief system for a long time of people doing this on Sunday mornings and throughout life. And we join with them today. So you'll see I printed the Apostles' Creed for us this morning before they come up. So join me. I ask, if, if you are not yet a believer, feel no pressure to say this. This is for you to just consider. We don't want you to feel compelled to put words on your tongue that you don't believe. But if you do believe in Jesus, join me in saying this creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Now, if uh, the Rothmans, the Headstroms, and who am I forgetting? Who else is coming up? The Krumas, thank you. Come on up. Again, as I mentioned, I'm going to, well, I'll talk by the microphone. This is an exciting time for us as a church. This is also a both brave and exciting time for them. As y'all, you don't take vows that often, but you are going to answer your membership vows in front of us and committing to us as a, a people and as a church. And that means this is a big deal. But the, the bigger deal of what we see behind everything happening here today is this. Do they stand up here because they figured it out and all these other people didn't? Do they stand up here because they're smarter than the rest of the world? They stand up here because of grace. That a God reached down and took a stone cold dead heart and said, be alive. Beat with passion for me. And so this is an encouraging time for all of us because we see the workings. That when the world says to you, God is dead, you say, uh-uh. He is working in grace in his people. So are you ready to take your vows? Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Do you? I do. Do you, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone as he is for salvation, as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? I do. And do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? I do. Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? I do. Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church, and do you promise to study its purity and its peace, do you? I do. Amen. Welcome. Welcome to our family. We are going to pray for you when we start prayers of the people in a minute. But for now, we just say welcome and are so glad that you're here. And as an expression of that grace that we celebrate and the joy we have, as you walk back to your seats, let's sing amazing grace over them as they return to their sing. So, uh, seats. So I'll start it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. turn with prayers to the people as I reminded you last week when we started Advent for Advent we will be ending with 
joining the worldwide church as our Lord taught us to pray. I'll get us there, but to start, Jim's going to start praying for a blessing on these new members as well as on our church. I then want you to pray just places, stand up, say loudly, names of people or places of what? We started with light of the world, our service started. You step down into darkness. What darkness needs to be prayed for? You don't have to say a long prayer, just say a name or a place or a situation or an idea. So there will be, I will transition us to that and just have popcorn, a few of us, then I'll conclude us. Okay? That's where we're going, and I'll conclude us with the, the Lord's Prayer. Jim, start us, please. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of uh, these families in our, the midst of our church. Uh, we want to lift up uh, Jason and Laura, Laurel, and we want to lift up Justice and Violet. We want to lift up uh, John, Christy, and Will, Doug and Libby. Lord, we pray that you will bless them richly as families and as individuals. Lord, we pray your protection over them. We pray that as you open opportunities for them to exercise their gifts in our midst, Lord, help us to gel together. And Lord, help us to have joy with one another as, as we worship together, as we serve together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the blessing of these families. Amen. <laughs> And now, Lord, here, even as we engage in popcorn prayer, we lift up to you these places, these items, these people that we see darkness and want you to shine your light. So here, these places we now mention. Lord, uh, the President of the United States and the in bondage with mental health issues. For Elliot in the losing of his identity, Lord. Mm. For those in addiction, Lord. Mm. Pray for the Bojack family. Mm. Lord, we're happy in the, in the audience right now. Mm. We have many refugees that we didn't know who they were. Are my friends struggling with this faith? Are my friends going through divorce? Lord, hear these prayers. We could, I could not cut it off, but we could continue. And there would be others you would bring to mind. For we need you, light of the world, in our darkness, in our community, in our world, in our own hearts. So help, we pray. And as we look for the coming of the kingdom, we pray as you have taught us, Lord. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Don't we uh, do this? Let's join. We're going to have the New Testament reading now, but let's join with the way so many around the church do it. We often don't in America, but in honor of God's word this time, <laughs> we should have before maybe too, let's stand for the reading of God's word. The New Testament reading is from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. 
He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Seth. You may be seated. Our Advent custom the last few years, and we do it again, is to have a children's sermon. So Laura's going to come. Especially looking out there to make sure I can see the eyes of, of all of our kids out there. I hope you guys can hear me okay in the back. I want you to imagine with me that we all went to the beach together. Okay, mm -hmm. We're all there. Everyone is swimming or floating or playing in the ocean. And then I find out that about a mile up the beach, someone has spotted a shark. And I me, all by myself, have to warn you to get out of the water because it is not safe. So how could I do that? Well, I could jump up and down. You know, I could do some of this on the beach, trying to get your attention, in which case most of you would be like, isn't she funny? She's just the weirdest person. Or you may think maybe there was something wrong. I could write a huge message in the sand. Get out and hope that you saw it and that waves didn't come wash it away before you noticed it. I could do that. I could run up and down the beach like this. <laughs> you know, the universal symbol for shark. You might, you might catch that. I could yell at you, get out, get out of the water. But you probably wouldn't hear that because the sound of the crashing waves and the crowds laughing and screaming at the beach. Or I could get a massive sound system with a huge microphone, and I could say, Get out of the water! There's a shark coming! Everyone run! Would you hear that? Yeah, Probably so. <laughs> what in the world does that have to do with Advent? You're wondering very wisely. Well, we just heard in our Bible reading this morning that long ago, when God wanted to get a message to his people, he did it through people called prophets. Lots of different men were prophets, and they both spoke God's message and did a lot of really crazy things in order to get the message across to God's people. He spoke through them at many times in many ways, but they did some weird things too, like Jeremiah broke a bunch of pots and then had something to say about that. Ezekiel dug a hole in his wall and then covered his eyes and crawled through it. And there are even weirder things. Isaiah walked around naked for a while. We don't recommend this, but you see, the Bible's a pretty funny book. God does some interesting things to get his message across. But did you hear this morning when God said that he was going to speak in the last days, how? By his son. That he was going to send a very special prophet, the best, the loudest, the clearest, the greatest prophet of all time, and that would be Jesus. That when Jesus wanted to get a message to his people in the clearest way, he would do that by sending his son. And is that not who we are waiting and watching for this Advent? Did you hear in those words that Seth read that Jesus is the exact imprint of his nature? That means if you want to know, have you ever wondered, well, what is God like? What is he like? How does he act? What does he think? What does he say? God says, look at Jesus. And that will tell you exactly what I am like. So I need a volunteer. I'm wondering, Annabeth, would you come and open a present for me? <laughs> Let's see what our gift is. I bet you guys might guess it. Why don't you pull that out and hold it up really high? What do you think that is? A toy what? It's a microphone. You get to keep that. And everyone else can get one afterwards. It's a microphone because I want us to be thinking this week as we wait for Jesus, the great and best prophet, that Jesus is God's microphone to the world. He is the best and loudest way of God telling us what he is like. And so in that spirit, we're going to sing our refrain again. If our musicians are ready, we're going to sing that we wait and watch for the anointed one and for our prophet. Let's sing together.
And now we're not done singing. <laughs> because let me, I'm going to pause because it is kind of weird where we have now this prayer of illumination. Why do we do what we do here? And then, especially if you've been with us, you know, when I end my sermon, kids, what do I do? I say this weird song that doesn't always go that well. Amen. Right? <laughs> Why do we say amen at the end? Sing amen. Because we sing before we start. And we, have, we are in a prayerful posture all through the sermon. And so this song right now is to put us in that prayerful posture as we hear God's word read and taught. So join me in uh, this song. Come thou almighty king, verse 2. song and then I printed the one song earlier incorrectly uh, so we're, we're getting there but right the, the gospel says you don't get it right it says you move on in grace and that's what we're doing I got a warning this is a weird sermon it's not going to be like I normally do I, as you know today's theme Laura hit it well is that we saw in our Deuteronomy passage that God's people were watching for this prophet. Abraham had been a prophet. Moses was the supreme prophet. And Moses in Deuteronomy 18 said, there's another prophet coming, and they were watching. Is this him? Is this him? Is this him? Is this him? But what our Hebrews passage say? Jesus came, and he spoke with clarity. Doesn't necessarily say he's the final prophet, but we see that. He's hanging out with the woman at the well in John 4, and she says, I see you are a prophet. Uh, when the apostles preach in Acts 3, and when Stephen preaches in Acts 7, they say Jesus was the prophet fulfilling Deuteronomy. So Jesus was that prophet. So that's our point. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> I want to drill down on it, don't I, like I always do. And so I want to organize our thoughts, what I want to say in, in, in three ideas, and it, it's simply this. Whoops, I didn't start my timer, and we all want that to happen. So uh, it keeps turning off. I guess I won't. Um, I want to start our thoughts. I, I want to organize my thoughts this way. I want to just do three things. One, start with two stories, cause two passages to collide, and then bring it home with two questions. Okay, start with two stories, cause two passages to collide, and bring it home with two questions. Two stories. First, have any of you, I doubt it, ever played a game called Grog? It was my favorite game in high school with my student ministry that I was involved in. And what we did is we would go to one of my friend's houses that had this big rectangular room with just one little window in it. And we would cover over the window with black paper, with construction paper, and then someone would be grog and the rest of us would be you know, game players, teammates. And, and what would happen is all the teammates would get on their hands and knees. The, the room was safe. There were no sharp edges or anything. Because if you turned out the light, it was going to be pitch black in there now, right? So if we played at night. So they, we would get our knees, close our eyes, cover our ears so we couldn't hear. Grog would take apart a flashlight with, in four parts. So the two batteries, the head, and then kind of the body. And put those at various places around the room on the floor. Then Grog would turn out the lights and say, go. And we had as much time as we needed to grapple, to, to grapple around, to feel around, and try and put that flashlight together. And if we put it together and shined it on Grog, Grog was dead. Grog, on the other hand, was crawling around. And if Grog ran into us and touched us, he would or she would whisper, because you didn't want people to know where you were in the room, I'm Grog, you're dead. And you had to lay down. It was basically freeze tag, but in the dark, trying to put together a, a thing. But I'm, it, and so imagine, here you are playing it, or I'm playing it. It was terrifying. 
I mean, you'd be crawling around and you'd hit a body. And you'd be like, is that Grog? I don't know. And you'd hear these stampedes of people <laughs> running away from something they've touched, you know? And yet at the same time, you're, you're like, but I need a, we, they're like, oh, do you have a piece of the flashlight? But you can't say, do you have a piece of the flashlight too loudly, you know, or else other people will, will hear you and Grog will hear you and he'll come and get you, you know, and you'd be running into dead people. You're afraid you're running into Grog. I mean, it was just terrifying and uncertain and, and confused. And of course, at the end, whether you won and got the flashlight and got Grog, or Grog finally said, did I get everybody? And turned the light on and you could see all these bodies laying all over the floor. Out of that confusion, the light finally brought clarity. Right? All I was afraid of, all I was uncertain of, the light brought this clarity. We have been saying it all through the service. The light has come to bring clarity into our confusion, our uncertainty, our fear, our darkness. That's what Hebrews is saying. It's what the Bible is saying, saying that Jesus comes as the final prophet to speak clearly right, into darkness. But as we often do, I want us to think about our cultural moment. Because isn't there a response that, whether, even if you believe in God, but just living in our culture, that you go, darkness? Really? Confusion? I mean, we really can get a lot done as men and women, even if you don't believe in God. And so isn't it interesting that if you think of this idea of darkness, put up against it the use of our culture's word of enlightenment. There's two major ways we use it. One is the cultural, the, the philosophical movement known as the Enlightenment in the 1700s, but which has run through, I won't do a philosophy class, modernity and into postmodernity. And as it has come, but it's basically this idea that says, we need to actually, to be enlightened people, it is the church that kept us in darkness in medieval times. And we need to trust in mankind and reason and science and all that exists are facts and matter. The things we can taste, touch, smell, feel, there is no ultimate truth. Nothing can tell you your purpose in life. Nothing can tell you right from wrong. The essence of being human is only, nothing can tell you that. It's only what you can taste, touch, feel. The enlightenment led to that and then now the postmodernity, and yet it was enlightenment. I could pick many examples, but I'll choose Bertrand Russell. He wrote this. Man is the product of accidental collocations of atoms. All the noonday brightness of human genius is destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. And only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation be safely built. That's one view in our culture, but notice it's one that says there's darkness. Sure, maybe we can find some flickers, but we will return to darkness, right? And yet it's from the enlightenment. Then move to another option that's in our culture. That is the, the option of enlightenment that is spiritual enlightenment. We most think years ago of Shirley MacLaine or Oprah, right? This thing of like, there is a light in you. Get in touch with your godness or your consciousness or your dignity and express it outwardly. I could read quotes on this too, but, but what's my point? That view too is saying the light is within, there is darkness out here. There is nothing you can know for certain and hopefully you will find the correct consciousness or the correct way in you to deal with the dark. I, there's so much more to be said on that, but my point is simply that we live in a culture that says, don't you say I'm in darkness. I live in a heart that says, don't you tell me I'm confused or need light. When in reality, that is how we're talking. <laughs> we are, humans are crying out saying, give me light, give me clarity. There is uncertainty, I need help. In the good news, of Advent is God moves into darkness. I'm, I'm choosing the darkness analogy and light a little bit more than the words and speaking prophet, but you see that is what the prophets were coming to do. Jesus 
is the son whom in these last days he has spoken through to bring clarity. I said two pictures, two stories. So it's the second one I want to give. How many of you remember triptychs? Do you remember AAA triptychs? Yeah, those of us that are older, you young millennials and children. Back before Google Maps, there was this thing called a paper map, and you would go to AAA for a special triptych. And if you were traveling to Florida, for example, you would get this little bound booklet at the top that would give you your route down, let's say, 95, and it would show you that for the next 20 miles or 50 miles, you, you, could, um, you could know, okay, there's gas here, there's a rest stop here. You can do all that on your phone now. But back then we had this, and the cool thing was when you reached the bottom of the page, you flipped it and you got another one. And it was how, and it would tell you your next exits. It was called a triptych. It was great. Our hearts long for a triptych to life. There's no page in your life right now that you can turn and know what 10 days looks like from now, what 10 years looks like from now. And into that darkness, you wish someone would speak, Jesus has. God has, because he's saying we're a part of his big story. So two stories that I wanted to start us with as we think about this um, idea of Jesus speaking as the final prophet. Now, now again, we so many places do that. But I said it's two stories and now cause two passages to collide. Our uh, tradition, the Presbyterian tradition, has often tr uh, trained children through a catechism structure. That is a question and answer structure. You ask the children questions, they respond. In the children's catechism we used with our kids growing up, it asked this question. It says, how is Christ your prophet? That's what we're thinking about today. And that answer is, he teaches me the will of God. But then it asks, why do you need Christ as your prophet? And it says, because I'm ignorant by nature. Again, not, not real positive view. But I need someone to, that was our first point. I need someone to speak. But again, as I wrestled this week, I thought, yeah, Lord, that just feels, ignorance feels mental. I don't want to just say, hey, they looked for Jesus as the prophet because of Deuteronomy 18. Jesus in all these different passages is, we're told he is the final prophet. Hebrews 2, be, 1 being one of them. So, hey, there's good information, go. It, it felt like a textbook, right? That you then were going to go get a, a quiz on. Like, oh, Jesus is the prophet, and here's where he shows up. And, and so I was praying, like, Lord, what to do? And then, oh, I didn't bring it up here. If you're reading with us in the Daily Prayer Project, where were we in the Old Testament this week? We were in Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4. Thinking about the start of the year and the start of creation and the need. Think about those stories. Remember, God created good Good, good, all things. And then in chapter 2 in Genesis, we see that men and women are placed in the middle of his creation and given blessing to make it flourish. This wonderful creation. They're his co-regents, his co-gardeners to care for it and tend for it. But what happens in Genesis 3? The enemy comes and uses words to twist God's words to bring a fall. As men and women rebel... And choose not God and instead follow after sin. And everything is broken. Their relationship with God, themselves, others in the world. But then what does God do in Genesis 3? And, and interestingly, he asks questions. The first one you know. I want us to look at the second one. The first one is, where are you? And he finds Adam. And Adam says, I hid from you, for I was naked. And what's God's second question? Who told you that you were naked? Now, um, as I've journaled about that this week, I thought, that's a really dumb question. I don't know. We could talk about that. Maybe you disagree. Take it scientifically. Had anybody told them that they were naked? You don't see it in the text. No one came up and said, oh, by the way, you don't have any clothes on, right? No one used words. But they knew it, didn't they? And what's my point? That in this fall, as sin enters the world, without 
out words, a cacophony of words had exploded inside men and women. And all of a sudden, the placid, peaceful, healthy inner life went absolutely crazy. It went crazy with self-contempt. It went crazy with guilt. It went crazy with shame. It went crazy with anger. It went crazy with inadequacies. It went crazy with fear. And then it went crazy outwardly with fear and hatred and anger and uncertainty and confusion. But do you see, no one said it, but there were words. There was speaking going on of all the brokenness of the world that God worded in a question, who told you? And so what did our God do? He says at the end of Genesis 3, I am going to bring one. He says to the serpent, right, in the curse, I will put enmity between you and woman, between her offspring and your offspring. He shall bruise your head and you're only going to bruise his heel. But that was God's first speaking at the whole promise to bring then his law through his key prophet Moses and then his word being obeyed and then his prophets coming to keep his people in line with that word for they were encouragers or rebukers based on how that's what a prophet was doing. But then as we see Jesus comes as the final ultimate prophet, not for us to take a textbook and look at it and do, but to quiet the cacophony in your soul. To have other words spoken over you that will quiet the fear, the self-contempt, the anger, the confusion, both internally and externally. Because he speaks words of love. What did we see last week? It's words of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people. Parakletos, that's last week's sermon. I won't go there. So that's where... We saw two stories of our need, kind of, but these two passages, I couldn't help this week but think, because I didn't want a quiz. I didn't want information. I wanted us to think, why do I need Jesus as my Savior? For crying out loud, or it's my prophet, for crying out loud, I need his words. Don't you? Which brings me to final two questions. I start with two stories, cause two passages to collide, but in case it wasn't clear, Genesis three and our Hebrews two passage, which is the one we're using to represent Christ be the prophet. So it caused two passages to collide. And then finally, bring it home with two questions. And they're simply this, are you listening and are you working in response? Are you listening and are you working in response? The first one, are you listening? And by this again, I don't mean, are you listening and trying to get it right? Like it's a quiz. I mean, are you listening in love? It struck me as I read about this this week and was trying to think Advent things, and I was reading John Owen about Christ being our anointed one. We talked last week. So this great Presbyterian theologian who has written volumes that you think, oh my word, if I want to get eggheady and in my head, let's read John Owen. He had an entire chapter, and do you know what it was about? That Jesus was delighted to be your mediator. He was delighted to be your prophet. He came in love to seek you. And I all of a sudden thought, wow, I think, I don't know if you're like me. I think of Jesus being like, okay, sit down, class. We're going to, your prophet, I'm going to speak to you. And I thought, what would it be like some of your teachers teaching in schools or have taught in schools? When you really love your topic and the people are listening and learning, isn't it like an awesome day and you're alive and delight in love? That's the way Jesus comes to us teaching us with a heart alive of grace, of goodness, of love to us. And so he brings his word to his people enlivened by his spirit. Are we listening? Are we engaging with him, his word, as he speaks to us through his spirit also? That's, there's more that can be said there, but I want to land. Are we listening? And then I said the second question, the, the two questions are we listening and are we, I said it, I didn't want to just make it, are we responding? Are we working in response? And by that I mean responding to listening to Jesus takes work. I've said this multiple times. Our Proverbs series that we finished a little while ago, I said this. But, but, but here's what I, I mean, is to respond to Jesus 
takes a lot of work of looking at what is the cacophony in my soul. What is it I'm running to in my soul? What is it I'm afraid of? And I don't want to pause and do that. I just kind of want to go, oh, just read my Bible, get some information, close it, go on. But Jesus calls us to hard work. Illustration, example. This week, don't know, not 100% sure why. Twice I woke up at 5 anxious. And I was talking to a friend Wednesday morning. And he said to me, kindly, he said, tell me about it. What do you think is making you anxious? And he started drawing me out, and I started saying, well, I've had this, and I've got this, and just knowing that, and, and all that. And he stopped me, and he said, that sounds like a lie. That does not sound like something God wants you thinking, doing, believing, or acting in. Think of Christ as prophet versus the lies of the enemy. He said, that's a lie, but then he didn't leave it there. He said, how do you repent of that lie? What might repentance look like in your life to believe the word of God and to enact it now today? That was hard work. I don't know if I ever did clearly get a good answer to it, but do you see what I mean? That Christ being our prophet isn't just, he's teaching you, so respond to him. It takes time, it takes work, it takes a journal. And we're busy Americans. Are you kidding? It's Christmas time in our culture. We're busy buying presents and going to parties or trying to think through what our schedules are. And Christ our prophet calls us into deeper love and relationship with him. Pray with me. Jesus, we are so grateful. We, beyond gratitude, come adoring you. Enliven our hearts in love more and more. For you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and do that through our time with you, through our listening with you, through our time around our Advent wreaths as households, through our worship, we give ourselves to you and ask that you would please make us more and more yours for your glory's sake. And all God's people sang, Amen, Amen, Amen. Let's uh, stand and sing. We will sing last week's chorus of Anointed One as well as Prophet this week. <laughs> this table, Christ calls his children to this table, for it is here that we see the light of the world stepping into our darkness, being the light in that he never sinned, he never strayed, he never wavered into darkness. And he did that for you and me, who so easily stray like sheep. But then not only that, taking on our flesh, he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, to bring clarity to our situation. He died. He knew that in bringing clarity to the darkness of our world, he had to take that darkness on himself. He had to sacrifice himself. And so he went to the cross where he paid for the sins of the world. If you believe he paid for your sins and rose to new life and offers you hope, and you have made that faith public, by joining the church, by being baptized, then this is your meal. This is a meal that represents all that Christ has done in drawing you into his family. Come eat this meal with us. I invite you to do that. If this is not yet your faith, we are so glad that you're here. 
but we ask you not to eat this meal. That similarly to the Apostles' Creed, you, we didn't want you to take those words on your lips if they didn't represent your faith. We, we don't want you to eat this meal if this doesn't represent your faith. Plus, God gives a warning of eating this, for this is a true and real and mysterious thing here. So if this is not yet your faith, please don't eat it. There's no embarrassment in that. We understand people are at various places. But whether you're eating with us this morning, celebrating what Christ has done for you, or whether you're still considering it, Christ offers himself to all of us. See here for Christ. Let's pray and thank him for this meal. We pause to ask blessing on this meal, Lord, that you would please in your great and mysterious way. Strengthen your people and be present here in your name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, as I did in his name, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Join me in our communion response for Advent. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. With joy we praise and thank you, gracious God. You sent Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, into this world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior, to bring freedom to the captives of sin, and to establish justice for the oppressed. We rejoice that in his death and rising again, we set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home, where we will sit at table with Christ our host. In this unity with Christians everywhere, we proclaim the mystery of our faith, your death, O Christ, we proclaim. Your resurrection we affirm with joy. Your coming we await with hope. Glory be to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are going to uh, distribute these little packets. If you are eating today with us, hold out your empty hands representing your need to be filled with Christ's presence and we will pass them out right now. So if you're eating, if you're not, just you can just keep your hands down. If you're eating, keep your hands out. I forgot, I'm going to say loudly, if you need a gluten-free wafer, raise your hand and keep it up till I bring it to you.
and forth the tab until the clear cellophane is loose, then peel it back. Take your wafer. Peter preaches in Acts 3 to those who had killed Jesus. He says, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, our Christ has suffered for us. This is his body given for you. Take and eat. Peeling back the foil to expose the juice, which represents his blood. Our Christ, the Lamb of God, has shed his blood to pay for all of your sins. Drink deeply from it, all of you. Amen and hallelujah. Let's stand and cry out together for the Lord to make all things new as we watch for him. to the cross with our first three responses and then we point up where Christ ascended with the last one. We, you don't have to, but we invite you to embody what we're saying here. All our problems we, we send, send to the cross, cross of Christ. Christ. All our difficulties we, we send, send to the cross of Christ. Christ. All the devil's works we, we send, send to the cross, cross of Christ. And all our hopes we, we set on the risen Christ. Christ. Stretch forth your hands and receive his good word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. For if he didn't, how could you hear him? The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Seth, send us out of here. Go forth in the name of Christ, remembering that he who came as a babe will come again at the end of time. Amen. Amen. Come, come, Lord Jesus. Jesus. And we are sent also singing our refrain that we used this week.
are dismissed. Have a good week. Thank you, George. Have a good week. Okay, see you, Mark. I do remember how we were doing it. I didn't practice it because I forgot to do it. Someone?